Hi everybody, today we are chatting about Pope St. Gregory I, and I'm including a stern warning from this doctor of the church that if you pay attention, could shave some serious time off of purgatory. But first, let's get to the vitals. Gregory was Pope from 590 to 604 AD, and he is counted amongst one of the great four Latin fathers of the church, along with Ambrose, Augustine, and Jerome. And that's pretty highfalutin company. Now maybe you know him as Gregory the Great, and there's a reason for that. He was a prolific writer, he was a church diplomat, and along with some other liturgical reforms, he was also the original promoter of Gregorian chant, which of course bears his name. So Gregory was a kind of a renaissance man before there was ever even a renaissance. He was so great that even Protestant reformer John Calvin liked him. There are even Lutheran churches who venerate him as a saint, and it's no wonder. Turning aside from a very promising political career, Gregory wanted to go into the religious life, and he did. And he even turned his house into a monastery after his father died. All he wanted was the quiet, contemplative life. But alas, God had other plans for this monk, and Gregory ended up becoming the very first monk to ascend to the papacy. And Gregory would have loved Pope Benedict XVI's call for the new evangelization. Rather than using military force to repel the barbarian invaders who were wreaking havoc all over the old Roman Empire, Gregory preferred to convert them. So he sent his monks out to do just that. Gregory was also a very big promoter of church unity, and he minced no words on this topic. And this is one of those times that I call a Danger Will Robinson moment, where we really need to pay attention to what the saint is saying, because he is identifying for us a very serious threat against the body of Christ. In his epistle number 17, he encourages the lay faithful to never in public, or even in secret, attack their bishop. Why? Because the bishop is the Lord's anointed. And earlier in the same letter, he talks about how in 1 Samuel, you see Saul chasing David all over the countryside trying to kill him over and over and over again. And David, even when he has the chance, doesn't kill Saul. Why? Well, David knew that Saul was the Lord's anointed, so he didn't touch him. So our bishops, in a similar manner, are the Lord's anointed. And even when you see them do something that you would consider to be blameworthy, when we insult them or we harass them, Ultimately, what we're doing is insulting or harassing Jesus Christ, whom they represent in the church. And Gregory is really trying to protect us from something he, he calls the impulse to elation, which we have a tendency to feel when we correct somebody. You know, that sense of moral satisfaction or superiority that we get when we set somebody straight. And really, that's just pride rearing its ugly head. And it can be exacerbated, too, when it's in relationship to someone who's in a position of authority over the top of us. Now, Gregory is not telling us that we should simply bury our heads in the sand if there really is an issue that needs to be dealt with. But by admonishing us to really watch our words, he's looking out for our best interests. Because don't forget, Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride comes before the fall. We also need to remember that we're all members of the same body of Jesus Christ through the sacraments. So when one member of the body is harmed or damaged, we all are. Of course, Gregory's admonition to avoid detraction in our comments doesn't just apply to our conversation about bishops. It has to do with everyone that we come in contact with. And we all know that's not so easy. So, what I want you to do is when you feel the desire to detract someone, especially your bishop, but not just your bishop, I want you to think, danger, Will Robinson, and then I want you to ask for the intercession of St. Gregory, not just for yourself, but for the other person as well. Amen.